I'd like to welcome to the stage, uh, firstly, Naomi Hurst. Naomi is a senior campaigner at Global Witness, an organization focused on um, ending environmental and human rights abuses by the exploitation of natural resources and corruption in the global political and economic system. Welcome, Naomi. I'd like to also welcome Sam Sheen. Sam is a financial crime prevention professional with 15 years experience. A practical expertise in compliance, Sam holds a number of qualifications, <laughs> <laughs> including walking onto stages. Uh, Sam's previous work experience includes working as an MLRO, a data protection officer, chief compliance officer, a group head of AML for various finance institutions, both offshore and onshore. So you're playing the bad guy on this one. <laughs> um, so I think in terms of running order, Naomi, yeah. uh, you may want to introduce yourself and do a bit on it. Certainly. No, thanks very much and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, so as Ted pointed out, yeah, I'm a campaigner at Global Witness. Um, hands up, I'm absolutely not a financial compliance expert. I come from a campaigning background. Global Witness um, is kind of a, a joint organisation of investigators and campaigners. So we look into the problems we see in the world, particularly in the natural resource sector, expose those problems, individuals and companies, um, then uh, look into what policy change is needed to prevent these um, crimes and uh, these corrupt events from happening, campaigning for change um, worldwide, um, and as well as in the UK, which is where my expertise is. Um, I am going to start off by bringing you back to the real world and one of the investigations that um, some very talented colleagues of mine recently brought out. Um, and I'm going to have to read from a legally checked piece of paper, so sorry if that's a little bit boring for a couple of minutes, um, but this is relatively sensitive. So the story I want to tell you um, starts in the Republic of Congo. And between 2013 and 2014, the son of the president seemingly stole over 50 million US dollars from the Congolese treasury uh, by setting up a complex and opaque corporate structure across multiple countries. Colleagues of mine trawled through various bank statements, corporate documents, secret contracts, and spoke with sources in a lot of different countries to get to the root of this story. Um, what they found was that the money was siphoned off under the pretense of an apparently sham contract the public works with a Brazilian infrastructure company called Aspabras. And to disguise the provenance of these funds, the money traveled via secrecy jurisdictions, including Delaware, BVI, before reaching Dennis, Cristel, Sasu, and Gesu's shell companies in Europe. This won't be a particularly um, astonishing story for most of you. But um, what they discovered was that um, Sasu and Gesu was actually the hidden owner of at least five EU-based shell companies, three in Cyprus, one in Estonia, one in Spain. And uh, at the heart of this apparent money laundering scheme is a Portuguese businessman, Jose Viega, who was also known to be a personal business victor, fixer for the Congolese presidential family. He was also an intermediary for Aspabras in Congo, he was also currently under investigation in Portugal for his alleged involvement in corruption and money laundering in Congo as well, hence the sensitivity of some of the stuff we uncovered. So I think this really goes back to what Michaelia was talking about in terms of figuring out um, corporate structures, whose um, uh, other names are enough, um, and, and who's behind what deals. One of the deals that is in particularly of interest to us in this case was struck by Aspabras with the Congolese government, and it was to perform a geological survey. Uh, Asperas subcontracted a Cypriot company called Gabox Limited to carry out this work. Now, this is really a case of, of looking into what this company is all about. Gabox actually had no obvious experience, no financial capital, or even employees. It had been set up just two days before signing the deal. Uh, the terms of the contract state that Gabox would receive 25% of the amount paid by the Congolese government to Asperas, according to a Swiss NGO, Public Eye. The project itself was valued at $200 million, meaning that Gabox would receive around $50 million. This is $50 million straight from the Congolese Treasury, which is a very, very poor country, one of the most fragile um, and vulnerable people, and that money was apparently going straight to the son of the president. So when we wrote to Asperbras, um, the company claimed that Gabox had been hired exclusively to obtain new deals on their behalf. However, we looked at the terms of the contract and it also indicated that Gabox was theoretically hired to carry out this mapping survey in Congo, a company two days old. So uh, during this period of time, Gabox was part of a structure consisting of three different Cypriot companies and according to the publicly available corporate documents, it seemed that Vega was the owner of this network, but this wasn't the case. Um, he was just a front man uh, whose presence disguised the true ownership of the companies and according to the documents seen by my colleagues, the real owner was Dennis Christel, Sassu, and Gesu. So when Galbox was incorporated and, and included in this web of companies under Vega's name, 
he had actually already secretly transferred the ownership um, of the network to the son of the president. And that was made, um, this transfer was made, it was carried out using a set of contracts that were stamped and made official by a notary in Congo Brazzaville. So uh, this really, really tells us that they need to get behind um, the surface of the story from public registers. We've since written to Asperbras, to Sasu Ngesu, the Congolese government, and to Baker's lawyers with questions. Um, and I have to tell you that Asperbras said it did not know anything about the deals closed by Vega or his companies, let alone any financial transactions carried out by Vega on behalf of any peps in Congo. Similarly, they declined to comment in further detail, given um, the ongoing Portuguese investigation into Vega and the details he has, de deals he has been involved in uh, involved with in Congo. Uh, the company stressed that none of its employees have been in charge in relation to that investigation so far. And, well, we received no substantive comment to the allegations put to any of the other parties within the timeline um, that we, we gave them. So um, I think I just wanted to bring this back into the real world um, from looking at corporate documents and um, brilliant visuals to actually bring it back to what it, money is actually being stolen and taken away from people. Um, so. For us at Global Witness, this investigation, it's not really novel. Um, time and again, we see wealth stolen from public coffers in some of the world's poorest and most fragile states, laundered through the financial system, and more often than not, with the support of northern institutions and professional enablers. Um, and so this work and seeing how money being stolen um, is, is laundered and enjoyed by the world's corrupt and criminal has led us down the route of following the money and understanding what we can do um, to basically prevent shell companies from being able to prosper. We've been at the forefront of the global movement for beneficial ownership transparency, um, and we've secured a working register here in the UK, um, and the promise of registers to come in the EU, the UK's overseas territories and crown dependencies, and we continue to make the case. Um, but I think what's different about Global Witness, and uh, we, we haven't really stopped there. So um, in 2018-19, we made it our mission to make sure that these registers are really working to the best of their capacity. Um, and no surprises, but the UK's one um, could be doing a better job. So um, with a group of volunteer data scientists in 2018, uh, we worked with Data Kind UK and we conducted um, one of the largest ever analysis of the PSC register, looking at more than 10 million um, corporate records. And so this is what we found. For, for most people, um, uh, for most companies registering beneficial owners, it's pretty straightforward. Um, after two years of operation, 87% of companies are finding at least one beneficial owner. But we're also finding that thousands of companies are finding suspicious entries um, or not complying with the rules in some very basic ways that companies have really could pick up on had they were the resource and the power to do so. So I won't go and read all of these exhaustively. Um, you're probably familiar with some of these things anyway, but I, just to um, basic headlines, common methods for avoiding disclosure, either a um, company says they don't have a beneficial owner, um, or there are foreign companies saying that they um, are the beneficial owner, um, directors linked to secrecy jurisdictions, and then proliferation of suspected nominees. Um, I suppose the good news is Scottish li limited partnerships. So kind of this gives us a hint of what transparency can actually do. Since um, they were brought into the remit of the transparency rules, uh, the rates of incorporations have plummeted to the lowest level for seven years. Obviously, this isn't to say that this criminal activity has stopped. Um, most likely, they've found different ways around the rules or different jurisdictions in which to incorporate. But it does tell us a very telling story about what bringing company um, ownership and structure out into the open can actually do. We repeated um, our uh, work in just earlier this year, um, and we've got a pretty static picture. But nonetheless, um, what we're seeing is that thousands of companies, hundreds of thousands of companies saying they don't have a beneficial owner. Again, um, this is all perfectly reasonable if um, no individual holds more than 25%. Uh, we've got thousands of companies naming other foreign companies as their ultimate owners. Um, thousands of companies are, which are suggesting to us that they're looking like they're actually controlled by nominees, and a couple of hundred circular ownership um, structures as well. We also developed, uh, went some way to developing a red flagging um, system, and whilst none of these flags in themselves indicate wrongdoing, it's obviously worth um, looking into it a little bit further. Um, and this is what we found. 2,000 company owners disqualified directors, and um, over 130,000 officers or beneficial owners are based in secrecy jurisdictions. 
Um, and our favorite headline stat, 4,000 beneficial owners, very precocious, under the age of two. Um, so this is telling us a complex story. One, there are far too many loopholes um, in the company's house which need to be fixed to tighten up and actually understand what's going on and are these um, uh, filings mistakes? Are they willful mistakes to try and distract people? Um, and how many of those two-year-olds have got MBAs? So, um, but I think one thing I would say, and this was always so difficult for us when we were trying to make the case for public registers globally, is that we have a fantastic register and a fantastic regime here in the UK. We can only figure out these mistakes because it's public um, and that because this um, register is also open data, it's structured data, and as you say, a total gold mine. Um, and we are just at the start. Um, we do have some ideas of how companies house can go about fixing that. I'll put that on the slide. Um, and I suppose one thing to say is conversations we've had with officials in Bayes um, are they are very, very excited about getting it right. But as we know, as of this morning, the political will to get these things done um, could be lacking. So um, I hope you'll join with us when you are taking part in these consultations and uh, be part of the conversation to try and fix this. So that's just kind of some food for thought. Thank you, Naomi. Um, Sam, I'll come you. to you in a, in a second. I just want to mention that we have a poll question that's now live on the Slido. Eight people have voted. I'd like to see a few more people vote, which is asking you about whether you consider power and control when assessing beneficial ownership within your KYC process. So we'll poll the results to that during the Q&A. I'm going to just very briefly carry the baton on from where Naomi got to, just looking a little bit further forward in terms of what's happened. So Naomi mentioned... European registers um, of the 28 member states. Um, there are 21 that have implemented a register. Um, you probably can't see into that detail, but there is a, there's a massive degree of variance into what is a public and open register like Companies House versus what is private and reserved for law enforcement. So that map, it's getting blue, which is good, and I've been doing this for a couple of years, focusing on these areas. So we are seeing North American perspective, we don't see probably that much changing in the current administration, but you know, FinCEN has, has brought some um, regulation around customer due diligence. Naomi mentioned very briefly the UK, so again, just what's happened in the last um, 12 months. A couple of things. Um, Bayes, which is the government department where Companies House sits, opened a consultation in May about the future of the register, thinking about exactly some of those points, data validation, um, cross-checking, improving the quality, essentially. And concurrently to that, I mentioned in my intro, but FCA, they ran an AML text print, and one of the use cases, the successful team that entered who won that use case, were looking to address this, so thinking about linking registers together, but also bringing in the banks. That's probably a good cue for you, Sam, in terms of taking the perspective of financial institutions and financial services firms involved in this space, um, part of 5MLD is that there's a discrepancy reporting yeah. mechanism, which is which is was at the heart of what the team there were looking to do. What's your view of that? Do you think it's a... Um, do I think it's a good thing? Yeah, and practicable as well. Oh, okay. So I get to be the bad guy. Um, I bet every financial institution was overjoyed to hear there was something else they were going to have to do when the 5 AMLD added that you were going to have to be the compliance officer for your registry and tell them if they had any discrepancies in the records that they held. Uh, and in theory, it sounds like a super idea. Uh, when I worked with a series of working groups across Europe late last year, no one had done anything in relation to it. They hadn't looked at what systems they were going to use to send a discrepancy notice to the registry. They had no idea if the registry had set up a portal in which to give these notifications. And the questions began to grow. People said, well, what if there is a true discrepancy? What if seven financial institutions all give notification about the same entity? Is there going to be a big red alarm that's put on that so everybody else knows not to rely on it? Is the registry allowed to ask us for CDD in case the registry doesn't have it? Is the registry actually going to do CDD, or can they go and use their own powers and go back to the beneficial owners and ask for information? So a lot of this has sort of been swirling around in the ether, and I think there's just so much change fatigue that's happening right now that this is kind of a please don't bother me with it till I absolutely have to. Um, so I'm a little bit worried unintended consequence-wise that we could have just a big crash with our registries with millions of emails flying around. Yeah. Um, 
Michaeli, from a European perspective, I know you've done some work with the European Business Control Register Programme. Um, could you give us a view of, of, of the maturity of that and where that might get to? Yeah, I mean, um, I, as I said before, I think that there are, we have witnessed uh, strong improvements in, in business registers activity across Europe. I mean, you have initiatives such as the BRIS, uh, so you have a, a directive on interconnection of business registers. You have projects such as eBox projects uh, joining together business registers from different countries, including the UK one, the Irish one, uh, for example. Uh, together, Italian, Romanian, and so on. So uh, I think th it is true, but there is one point uh, that business register are still uh, the expression of uh, the company law in the country and of a government and political will. And this is enough to say that we will never reach, uh, uh, you know, a full integration of uh, registers. Uh, and so this work is somehow is done by, by private data providers. Uh, because if there is something which government will leave, it will not be the comp national company law. So we will see forever discrepancies and uh, differences across business registers mm. in Europe and uh, outside Europe even more, more yeah. frequently. Yeah, Amy, from a UK perspective, I know you've had mm. a lot of work with the PSC register, you've mentioned some of that. Are you still in dialogue with the with that organization and I know that you were actually helping them in certain yeah. things with actually the system yeah. that they built mm. to record. Yeah, I mean, we've seen some promising um, noises, at least from Companies House, so the report it now function um, mm -hmm. uh, was, um, as far as they could go at that particular point in time without legislative power, was very, very promising. But certainly we see huge challenges with this discrepancy um, uh, requirement to report. Um, so, in our consultation response to Bayes and in meetings with them, um, it is very much around the need for bulk reporting, for um, rapid triage between companies' house, law enforcement, and rapid feedback to private sector and NGOs um, who are using this data to identify red flags. Um, and so, these are ongoing conversations, and they are going to happen for a very long time to come. But um, I suppose just to reiterate, I mean, as many voices as possible to make this thing work, the better. The UK's um, company's house registers is one of the first in the world. The UK currently, this, even this government, does want um, to be leading the stage uh, internationally on, on public registers. They're leading an international beneficial ownership campaign around the world along with the, the Danish government. Um, so they're staking their reputation on this. So there is a lot of leverage that voices like yours can have to make sure that this thing works and, and works effectively, particularly as the EU comes online. Um, there will undoubtedly be teething problems, but um, yeah, just hold the course, basically. Okay. Are you looking to me? Yeah, we're telepathic, <laughs> I think you're gonna make a point. Oh, well, I was just gonna say, I'm, and I, Michaela, you know, might know slightly better than me, uh, there is a directive that's been introduced about the interconnectivity of directives across Europe. Um, and, and the one phrase that really bothered me was the one that said, um, information submitted for incorporations it must be done in a way that is fast, efficient, and uh, commerce friendly, which to any compliance person just sounds absolutely horrific. Um, and as you go through all of the draft text, not once does it say, uh, for AML purposes or financial crime prevention purposes, we can do, or member states will have the power to, et cetera. So, it's very much designed to make incorporation or commercial activity across member states much more efficient. Registries can share information, but it's only in relation to similar companies, so you don't have to keep producing your beneficial ownership information again and again. But what's lacking still is the teeth around the financial crime prevention side of things to be able to take action, jump in, and stop a potentially systemic actor who might be acting in more than one member state. Just thinking about with the five MLD, are there any uh, sanctions around discrepancy reporting? So if, if there is, a, I don't know if there are any specifics that have been discussed, if finance institutions fail to report discrepancies, are there any implications it, for that? I don't know. It kind of depends, right? Look, I, I think uh, I used to love this where I'd hear compliance people try and threaten the first line of business to do stuff by saying, and the regulator will come and fine us, and then they get really sad because they wouldn't get fined. And nobody would believe them, right? So they'd say, we don't get a copy of that passport. Oh, if that certification isn't perfect. And truth be known, a lot of regulators gave people an X on the examinations, right, when they came to do an on-site because your KYC wasn't up to date. 
Um, but I think more and more businesses are getting bold, and quite rightfully so, to ask the question, so what? If I know how this customer behaves, if I know what the purpose of this business is, if the anticipated activity matches the risk profile, so what if I didn't send something about a discrepancy that someone's middle name wasn't on the registry? Um, and then the question is going to become, so what if the FCA, for example, who's examining you finds that? What are they going to do? Don't do it again? Is it relevance? Has it helped prevent financial crime in any way? So I think in some respects the, the stick approach is not going to be particularly effective to this. There has to be some sort of benefit, some carrot for the business to go, actually, this is really helpful for us to do it. Um, but I think that there are no real legs for an enforcement mm -hmm. action to be taken yeah, based on that. Certainly early days, isn't it? Just calling out to the, the, the um, poll question. We've got 33 people uh, filled it in. I know the answers, so I'm going to see if you guys can guess in a second. Just want to introduce, we've talked some I minutes mean, of build out from Michaela. So in terms of beneficial ownership, we've, we've been speaking to this topic for a long time in terms of shares. So share ownership, if you have a certain percentage of ownership in the company, you have um, de facto control if you have more than 25%, if you look at the strict guidance. Now, we've been looking into the, the control or the structures, okay? So partly based on some of the research Michaela's talked to, if you can see that, but this is an example, anonymized of, of a structure. The orange percentage is the de facto control these people have over that company. Okay, so if I have 1% of a company, but Naomi has 49.5%, and McKaylee has 49.5%, my 1% actually is quite important because if we um, form a coalition, if, for example, you owed me some money, uh, I had some leverage over you, something to that nature, then you can see how, just with pure math, the combination of those two um, percentages linked to control, and it really talks to some of the looking at the whole structure. Um, I won't go to the poll question response yet, and we're asking the audience, is this something that you look at? But I guess, again, coming to you first, Sam, in terms of practical KYC operations, people already being asked to look into ownership, do you see this as, you know, how, how might this fit within the, the KYC process? looking into control okay. structures, how might an organization, would it be asking from a questionnaire to, oh, to, to look at that away. context? No more tick box, no more questionnaires. No, no, no. This, I'm sort of having a Groundhog Day moment around control. So for those of you who are kind of my age, who are around when the 3AMLD came in, do you remember there was a lot of excitement about certified documents, non-face-to-face business? We could have equivalency lists of jurisdictions. And as we rolled up towards the 4AMLD, we all went, oh, shoot, that didn't work. So then we tried to change it. And then FinTech appeared, and there were lots of new ways we could do non-face-to-face business. And we realized certification isn't particularly helpful. We added on some domestic peps in the new requirements, right? And now we have all these requirements around beneficial ownership. Now, that's all great, except what we did the last time is we took our eye off the prize, and we had to wait till the next major regulatory change happened and then try to introduce controls there. So we run the same risk now. We've got this amazing beneficial ownership transparency happening, but the truth is most people don't understand what control is. And if you wait for the regulations to tell you, it will be a massive burden. So last night I was reading some of the cases and I drew this about 10 minutes ago, right? So I came up with uh, 10, 12 different ways you can control a business. Um, and it's, some stuff is obvious, right? Some stuff is owning shares, for sure. Uh, partnership interests, but then there's other things. There can be things such as, I have particular expertise. So I have completely useless directors on the board, but maybe they hire me in as a consultant. And in actual fact, I get paid consultancy fees instead of putting me on as a shareholder. And I'm really the controlling mind of that business. What if I'm a fund administrator, for example, and I offer to put directors on the board, but the asset manager gets to determine the real value of the shares, and we want to arrange a deal with another jurisdiction. We won't give them money, but we'll exchange the shares. If I have the ability to influence the votes needed to get those shares issued and make that transaction, it doesn't matter what the rest of the shareholders think. So you can see there's lots of really, really complicated ways, and some are very simple. Authorized signatories, do we check them to make sure they're real? We should, but how many things do they sign? What's their background? What's their relationship with the other people? So I think if we're really gonna leverage this beneficial ownership stuff, you've got to look at the forest, like, or the zoo in which these people operate. 
some of the, the research, Michaeli, Naomi, that you've come across. I wonder, I've got to raise a topic of privacy. You know, it's, it's out there. You know, we don't need to talk about those four letters that we spent all of 2017 and 18 talking about, but you know, GDPR, I've mentioned it now. But <laughs> in terms of the research that you're doing and the counterpoints, a lot of it is, okay, I have a right to, be, to retain privacy. Um, I wonder if either of you have a comment or some of the some of the perspectives that you've come across in your research. Yeah, I mean, research is exactly confirming what uh, what we are talking about today. Um, uh, in terms of control, uh, we, we've seen, especially in cases uh, of organized crime, controls through family uh, uh, relationships. This is crucial. I mean, probably something I mentioned last year, but we did this research on uh, analyzing companies seized from organized crime in Italy about 3,000 companies, and the number of women uh, as shareholders is, is about twice the number of women as shareholders of Italian companies. And obviously this is not because uh, Mafia is promoting uh, female entrepreneurship, but, but because <laughs> if they need uh, to, to get some figureheads, they, they, they uh, find it, it in the family. It was the construction industry, wasn't it? I remember the takeaway was a construction industry company with female owners. No, yeah, I mean, <laughs> purely it's a red flag, uh, yeah, purely fine. speaking. I mean, Obviously, uh, one has to, to consider it, but I mean, this is another example of control that you may have. Uh, and so research is absolutely, I mean, the regulation itself is saying, well, that controls a company and there is this, this wording, through other means, okay? And, and the point is, are we, or you, as a, as a obliged entity officer or compliance officer, uh, asked to check all the other means that a certain person should control a company? Well, if I read the regulation, you should say, yes, I have to do that. But okay, what tools I have in my hands? Mm -hmm. If I don't know even if this lady is uh, the, 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 the wife or the, the partner of, of a man because they have no access to, you know, uh, anagraphic data. I have a couple of questions, thank you, for, from the audience coming through, um, both anonymously, that's fine, we don't mind anonymous questions. Anonymous companies we're not too <laughs> passionate about, but, um, <laughs> so for Naomi, you may react to the previous point, but the question here is, do you feel the move from annual returns, which mm -hmm. companies had to file, I think it was 2016, 17, to now filing confirmation statements, which mm -hmm. is part of the PSC mechanism, <clears throat> has had an effect on transparency? No, I actually couldn't comment to that. Um, I okay. don't think there's been enough time yet to have seen the, the change. Um, uh, if yeah. I may jump back to the previous yeah, question yeah, about yeah, privacy. Do. Sorry about that, but if that person wants to have the chat later, please let me know. Um, yeah, so I suppose for us, um, we take, <laughs> as a global witness, we spend a lot of time exposing individuals and companies, and so unsurprisingly, we take quite a robust attitude to complaints around breaches of privacy. Um, for us, uh, particularly around anonymous companies, you know, you've got a company, um, there are privileges afforded to you because of that um, privileged status, which um, puts you in, in, it's proportionate to reveal who you are. Um, and um, beyond some of our allies in this space, I think we go further and say that that also needs to apply to trusts, and certainly we've um, responded as such to consultations around the transposition of the fifth anti-money laundering directive here in the UK. A um, particular bugbear of mine is um, how the UK government currently, the current UK government at this day, um, is uh, interpreting um, the EU's identification that as NGOs, journalists, we have a legitimate interest to apply to see information about who owns or who, who benefits from trusts um, incorporated here. Um, so that's a privacy battle that's probably next on the horizon. Um, I'll be interested to hear from, from people in this room and um, from your research about how often you, see, you come across trusts um, as kind of the, the next secrecy um, vehicle of choice um, is a way of getting around um, public, um, federal, well, public registers of, of companies. Um, and similarly, I suppose when it comes to privacy, uh, we have a long running campaign to um, bring in the register of overseas entities um, which would uh, reveal the real owners of foreign companies that own UK properties here in the UK. So just to give you a flavour of, we're really not shy about bringing these people out into the open. If you are owning something through a corporate vehicle, whether that's a company or trust, you should be out in the open um, as, as the basics, really. Um, so in terms of any questions I, I'd throw back, yeah, interested to hear about what people think about trusts, interested to hear about that particular question about annual returns as well.
Thank you. I have a question about Brexit, but I'm going to save it. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> it's a backup. Um, privacy. So we text print a lot of focus on privacy enhancing technologies, right? Yep. So that we can transfer data and, and thinking about utility models, which have been launched in some of the emerging markets, have been retracted in some of those markets. Um, just come back from a week in the Nordics, they're uh, full steam ahead. Sam, perhaps you could talk a bit about that sort of you know, the future in terms of privacy enabling, sharing of data, and where some of the, the good, the bright spots as the sun comes out that you're thinking about. I sometimes think the GDPR is a bit of a furphy. Like everyone makes a really mad fuss over what they can share and not share. And, and I just would encourage everyone who works in AML, financial crime prevention in this room, please go learn about the GDPR because you can have a sensible discussion with your data protection officer if you do. I mean, really, it comes down to, um, it, it, they're not hard rules. They really aren't hard rules. And I, I see too many times where, um, as part of the KYC exercise to understand a structure, everything is saved. Even the useless stuff is saved. And now you have all this data you don't need, including personal and sensitive data, which has assisted you in no way understanding the risk profile of the customer. Now, that having been said, there are, in Europe, member states who have very specific bank secrecy or confidentiality obligations. Um, and there is some fantastic technology you saw at the tech sprint, things that would essentially allow for encrypted data to come through. And there was one very cool idea built by a team who knew nothing about financial crime. It was absolutely, they just basically, I described one MDB to them, and I said, find a way for all those banks to have told each other they had something unusual or suspicious. Um, and it was very, very clever, and it would simply have allowed people to notify the next bank over in the neighborhood I have this person with this transaction. It gets all rolled up. I'm being overly simplistic here. I'm sure Keith will explain this better on AI. And essentially it will say, message me with a zero or one and tell me if you have something similar. But you don't see it because this system talks to this system. So I don't give you any personal information. I don't tell you anything about the people. And if we end up with a one, we both know we have a problem person. You know who they are. I know who mine is, but we don't tell each other and then we can take action on it. Now it sounds, Space age in some respects, and there were lots of questions about it. And in fact, we had the ICO with us at the tech sprint, uh, who guided them along and told them what the parameters were. So, the possibilities for this are really quite quite impressive. Um, but for it to work, everyone has to agree to be a part of that circle of the neighborhood, um, because we we can't have partners midway who say, "I don't want to play, I don't want to form a part." And in fact, they may be the correspondent bank, or they they've got a key bit of the story that we need to add in. Thank you. I have a question of the question. This is, again, a more practical one, so I might come back to you, Sam, but to please feel free, Naomi and Michaeli, to jump in, maybe your perspective. In terms of onboarding KYC, I guess for the for people who are in that, at the front line, any tips when you just come across that culturally or in a country where we know there is deficiencies in information, either the ownership is not there. Mm -hmm. The question also asks whether compliance culture is low, which might be the point if the data may exist, but the reluctance to provide that to you might be the issue. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, full disclosure, so I used to work offshore, and I used to work for a fund administrator, and we had some delightful asset manager clients who had no patience whatsoever, uh, and thought compliance was just the end of all evil, and we were just slowing everything down and scaring away customers. So we tried as much as we could to have a good relationship, but it was a tough, a tough road to hoe. And a number of the funds in which we invested were in some interesting jurisdictions, as were the underlying assets. And I think one of the problems we have as cons compliance is we're not very good at contextualizing what we need. Um, so in other words, um, just asking for information based on the square parameters of a corporate entity is not helpful to someone on the other end who's a relationship manager, for example. Um, so I remember getting in one big fight with someone who kept asking for a Chamber of Commerce certificate from a sovereign wealth fund. And I kept having to explain over and over and over again, the government has created the Sovereign Wealth Fund. It doesn't need a Chamber of Commerce certificate, but they still had it on a list. I think when you're dealing with less transparent jurisdictions, the kind of stuff that matters and gets you in the right direction around beneficial ownership and controllership is who's operating it, how long is it going to operate for, can you give me some information about the founders, how long have they been in the business, uh, what's the nature of the industry? Are there any plans to expand? Uh, who are your experts? Um, some of it's a bit of flattery, but you would be amazed how much information you can get from that. And then strategize about what you need. So 
I think if you just go in with the basics, quite blindsided going, I need everyone with 25% or more. Mm -hmm. I need this. I need the authorized SIG list. I need the this. I need the that. I mean, a common thing people don't think to ask for is a board resolution. And I often compare that board resolution to who I've been told are the controlling people on the various committees. And ironically, they often don't match up. And I get to go back and say, who is this? Or if we're exchanging correspondence, I will say, who is this person who keeps appearing on all of the emails and do my own research? I might, in fact, dig up and uncover a real controller. So some of it's being a bit innovative, but putting yourself on the side of the business and thinking about how you'd ask those questions. And I think you mentioned it, but a lot of it hinges on the risk assessment, being able to prioritize. And I think, Michaela, you're thinking about ratings across or indicators, let's say, across a pool of companies. Do you see an application in that in terms of being able to filter and prioritize? Yeah, I mean, this is what the risk assessment uh, approach should, should tell you, is to, 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 to take into account all of these uh, uh, indicators or metrics which could guide you uh, helping to filter out. But this is not a, an answer yes and no. I mean, uh, and beyond the, the development in terms of artificial intelligence, uh, uh, analytical approaches, statistics, and so on, uh, still the human factor is, is still crucial in uh, as ultimate owner, I would say, of the decision in discerning if the answer provided by the tool has to be reconsidered or not. So obviously, uh, tools are a great, uh, of a great help, but, but does not uh, resolve the, the problem. So at the end, it's, it's you, ultimately, who has to decide and reconsider. So this combination of human factor and, and, and uh, technological factor is, is crucial, but the human factor is still there. Mm -hmm. So a compliance officer is, is a kind of job, and this is to assure you that we never disappear, because it can be done only by an individual. <laughs> uh, so I think that uh, that is the, the, the answer. Really. Yeah, we're going into AI machine learning very deep for our last topic, so let's um, build up to that one. If I could ask the, um, just to push the poll results, from Slido onto the, onto the screen now, just in terms of the questions that we've asked people, and people may have a flurry. So, so we're asking people, it's, it's to the point of currently, are you looking at this context, power, control, and not just pure share ownership when assessing for, for beneficial ownership during your due diligence process? So we can see that it really, I guess, plays out what we've just been speaking to. So, you know, the top answer is yes, but it's only those high risk cases, um, we've got some then people either side of yes or no, and then the bottom end of that, 19%. Um, quite even split as well, just in terms of those results. Sam, would you, ex is that what you kind of broadly would have expected? I'm encouraged that we've got two yeses, and I know there's probably a few people from BVD voting in the audience, but I'm certainly encouraged that we've got, um, yeah, that I think the sensible approach to start with, risk assessment, prioritization. I can be a little bit bold here. Um, I, I ran a training on sanctions, and we were talking about sectoral sanctions. There's a fit, you can all pretend you understand sanctions if you don't work in it. It's just an odd. So there's a 50% ownership requirement. And after about five minutes of teaching, I said, does everyone know how to count up shareholdings? And then I was going, does anyone know the difference between an issued share? Right? And people were sort of looking, and I'm like, does anyone know the difference between preferred shares and ordinary shares? And it suddenly occurred to me, we kind of miss a trick as the compliance function with these, which is some of the reason why this stuff ends up there is we actually don't teach people companies or legal arrangements 101. You know, so we have people chasing stuff around protectors and settlers and trusts, for example. But they don't really understand what the potential they have in terms of decision making or influence. Or even if you see shareholding and you get a lot of complicated information, which shareholdings are completely irrelevant, or sometimes they don't realize that the real power hides in agreements such as governance agreements, which often sit below highly invisible around trust and company structures that will actually tell you who's got the real say. So in some ways, Ted, I, I'm not surprised, but the real danger is if we don't start training compliance people, when you get the beneficial ownership information, what do you do? What does it tell you? you know, how do you classify what's worth looking at? it gobbles up a lot of time, mm -hmm. and the challenge is finding a way to do it super efficiently. Yeah, and I think, Michaela, you talked about the golden age of the availability of data, but I think it's really good and interesting that we're very much early on in, in that cycle. Um, we've been running for about 50 minutes. I think we started the panel a little bit soon. Are there any questions from the audience? I could ask someone if they want to just contribute, um, anyone that voted for the top answer or second answer to ask a question. 
If not, you could join me in thanking the panel for their contribution. That session, thank you very much.